20, 30 seconds before you scroll on. And if you enjoy this video, please like, share, and if you have more questions, give me a comment. Remember, these are facts and factual things and actually the way fishery science and management works. So if you've had your head in the sand and you've been getting all your fisheries science and management information from Facebook, this might blow your mind. So grab a seat, pause the video maybe, go make some popcorn because we're going to be here for a minute. Feds, NOAA Fisheries, the Gulf Council, they don't manage Goliath Grouper. FWC does. And this is a state waters issue. So FWC is the one talking about Goliath Grouper, not the feds. And guess what? We need dead fish to do a stock assessment on Goliath Grouper. They've been closed umpteen years. And we don't have dead fish. And at the end of this video, I'll talk about more, uh, a little bit more why we need dead fish for a stock assessment. Snook redfish and trout reopening, despite your opinion on that issue, is based on fisheries independent monitoring, or FIM. If you don't know what that is, you should probably watch this video. And before continuing to post silly stuff online, find out that these are state-managed species, not federally managed, nothing to do with the feds, and the recent closures of certain fisheries. Yes, lane snapper, red grouper, the midwater snapper complex, including queen snapper, a ham bone, silks, they did close, and that stinks, but those were ACL closures. That does not mean someone was like, oh, these fisheries are super unhealthy, let's close them. It means the ACL was reached. If you don't know what an ACL closure is, watch this video. Flounder, for the love of all things holy, stop commenting and posting flounder were closed. They were not closed. They had a seasonal closure. Flounder management changed. FWC manages flounder, and they decided to implement a spawning seasonal closure. So the season closed. No one closed flounder. So please stop posting that. It's making me a little upset and frustrated. So this is a very abbreviated thousand foot view of how fisheries science and management works. Because I'm tired of reading all the stuff that's being posted from, honestly, just an ignorant standpoint. And we all need to take a minute to get educated on how this system works. So that way you can be effective and part of the change. Instead of just posting stuff online and ranting and, and passing along poor information. Like... Someone's making all these funny memes about how the Gulf Council closed this this species or that species. I get it. It was funny the first time when it was the pinfish thing. I laughed. Now it's just getting stupid. FWC. FWC is a state management body. They are state managers. They manage state waters inside of nine nautical miles from the demarcation line and inside in state waters like rivers, lakes, bays, sounds, except for red snapper. So for red snapper, the Gulf of Mexico Fishery Management Council voted in NOAA Fisheries Southeast Regional Office delegated private recreational management of red snapper to the five Gulf states for private angling component and state manit or yeah, state managed charter boats, those charter boats without federal permits. Also, FWC can make a regulation for state waters, and if there's no federal regulation on the books, the state and FWC can choose to extend their state regulation into federal waters. They most recently did this with blackfin tuna and flounder. They made a state regulation and pushed it into federal waters. They also historically have done this with African Pompano. That's why we're the only state in the Gulf of Mexico that has federal waters, African Pompano regulations. You can go to Louisiana and catch 30 of them in your boat. You're good to go. In the state of Florida, you can only catch two. It's a whole nother thing. The FWC holds a meeting, and when they discuss a topic, they typically will take public comment right on that topic. The FWC typically has about five meetings a year, 
and there's seven commissioners on the FWC commission. Those commissioners then discuss a topic that the staff brings to them. The staff's topics are on the agenda and they're public about two weeks ahead of time and you have time to submit written comments. If you can't make it to the meeting, you can submit written comments. I believe it's about a week prior to the meeting uh, is the cutoff for written comments to be included and given to the commissioners prior to a meeting. Then the meeting starts, the commission meeting starts, and those seven commissioners will discuss the topics on the agenda. Then they hold public comment directly following that discussion. Then after public comment concludes, they vote on the topic. Then FWC staff will delineate and pass along that vote to the general public. And it's mind boggling how fast they do this. I've been to an FWC commission meeting trying to get the word out about the vote that just occurred and I was posting as they were voting and the staff beat me to it. It's amazing how quickly uh, FWC does such a great job passing along information. That's why Facebook's blowing up today because the FWC had a commission meeting today and the staff has been sending out emails about the votes that have occurred. So. Nothing's crazy is going on except for the FWC had a commission meeting. They have them about five times a year. They're typically two days long and one day is fishing. Typically it's the first day and then the second day is hunting. So if you want to attend a commission meeting, you can and you can have your voice heard. You can give public comment and the commissioners generally are good people. They're willing to listen and you can catch them in the hallway sometimes talk to them individually if you know something's coming up that you have a strong opinion about you can try to talk to them ahead of time too which is perfectly okay you know you can share your opinions voice it everything's transparent this doesn't happen in a vacuum guys and you can google fwc commission meetings it gives you the dates of when they occur you can look back at that and the agenda is posted you know what they're going to talk about and you can send written comments. You don't have to show up to a meeting. So if you're going to comment now about, oh, but they have it during the week when I'm at work, submit a written comment. So Gulf of Mexico Fishery Management Council. This is the federal body that passes federal regulations. Gulf of Mexico Fishery Management Council. Now the council makes a vote on an issue and once they vote on that issue, then it's submitted to NOAA's uh, Southeast Regional Office, or better known as CERO. When that vote is submitted to CERO, then it takes CERO a little bit of time to implement the rule uh, or the regulation that the council voted. Typically, that time frame is about six to eight months. Unlike Lane Snapper, where it's been almost a year and they still haven't implemented the catch level increase that the council voted on. But that's a whole nother video that hopefully you've seen because that was the last video we did on this stuff. Now, Gulf of Mexico Fishery Management Council votes and regulations, they apply to everybody fishing in federal waters beyond nine miles across the entire Gulf of Mexico. Council meetings happen about five times a year. They last four to five days. Those are all public, listed right on the Gulf Council homepage, and you can even today go on the Council's homepage and see all the meetings scheduled into 2022. So literally all the meetings are there public, and about uh, two to three weeks ahead of a meeting, all the information in the agenda is posted online. It's called a briefing book. You can look through it, you can review it, you can send emails to the Council members. Their emails are listed on the website. So if you feel strongly about some, email the council. Most of them will respond to you pretty quickly and they're all understanding people to a degree when it comes to certain issues. Other issues, they're kind of dead set on because they have strong opinions or they're feeling a certain type of way. The council has 17 voting members. Most of those voting members on the council are private recreational representatives backed and really uh, beholden to CCA. So before you say, well, the council's all about commercial fishermen, it's not. It's heavily private recreational angling right now. Florida has four representatives on the council. So out of the 17 voting members, Florida has four of them. 
because we represent the largest number of anglers and the largest number of landings, and Florida's pretty much the best part of the Gulf of Mexico, in my opinion. That wasn't factual. That's the one part of the video that wasn't factual. I'm sorry. Each state has a state representative uh, representing the state. So for the state of Florida, our state rep on the Gulf Council is Martha Gaez. She's from the FWC. She's a really, really cool lady. She always answers her phone. And if you don't call her and scream at her, if you come to her uh, logically with a decent argument based in science and, and not totally off left field, she's willing to listen. And she's super cool and super helpful. We also have Tom Frazier, who serves as the head of the science for the state of Florida. And he's a super, super intelligent scientific dude. And he's always more than happy to sit there and hang out and talk to you and listen to you and give you advice. He's even, when he was chair of the council, he's even come down and sat in the back of the room at some of the federal uh, charter uh, captain meetings that I've held because he was interested in how the charter captains felt on certain issues. That's how passionate and involved Tom Frazier is, and many of the council members are the same. We also have a new council member representing the state of Florida. He's Bob Gill. He's one of only two there's two commercial representatives on the uh, Gulf of Mexico Fishery Management Council. Bob Gill is one of them, happens to be from Florida. We also have Phil Disco. He is the ex-president of Yamaha USA. And he's one of the most intelligent, fair, level-headed dudes I've had the pleasure of speaking with. He always is more than happy to sit and hear me out and always uh, more than happy to reach out to me and talk to me about certain issues. And even when we disagree, we have a great conversation and he's always willing to hear me out and hear my side of the argument. Uh, and another reason why I'll only use Yamaha outboards. Uh, the council has an SSC or Science and Statistical Committee. That body is basically under the council's purview and their whole purview, the whole job is to review scientific stock assessments before they come in front of the council. Because the SSC is made up of a bunch of scientists and experts who review the stock assessment model, how it was done, some of the different intricacies of the assessment process, and they ultimately will set the OFL and ABC. The OFL is the overfishing limit. The ABC is the acceptable biological catch. So the SSC sets the OFL and ABC, and then the council will come in and review the assessment and the SSC recommendations and hear from the chair of the SSC. Then the council will talk it out, most of the time argue it out, and then the council will set an ACL and then sometimes for some fisheries, an ACT, or annual catch limit, annual catch target. That's what ACL and ACT stand for. The CDAR stock assessment process is how scientific assessments uh, work. That CDAR stock assessment process is outside of the council process. It has nothing to do with the council. So the council and NOAA fisheries is not responsible for assessing the stock or the health of the fishery. So stop blaming the council for stock assessments because it's not a part of the council process. It's a part of the CDAR process, which is another open and transparent process that you can be a part of. They hold open meetings. You can attend them virtually. You can send in your comments. You can show up in person. They're open to the public. And the data workshops are a lot of the times the best way to get involved in a CDAR stock assessment process. When that CDAR process concludes, then they have a final assessment kind of summary that's sent out. So the most important assessment that most of us in the Gulf are concerned about right now is GAG Grouper. It's currently underway, and we should see the finalized assessment summary ready in around November of this year. A lot of people are talking online like, well, expect a gag grouper closure this year. Dude, the assessment is still ongoing. 
once the summary is finally ready in November, it still has to get reviewed by the SSC. And then once reviewed by the SSC, it has to go in front of the council. The council has to then argue about it, talk about it, vote on it. Then it has to go to zero, and they have to implement the rule. And with Lane Snapper, it took them almost a year to implement that rule. So, I mean, we're, we're talking best case if gag grouper assessment is as negative as they've talked about and I've heard, then we will see that implication on our fisheries regulations, most likely not until the very bitter end of 2022, but more realistically, like 2023, because no fisheries takes so long to implement rule changes. Lane snapper, still a fresh wound in the heart, you know, um, but Anybody can get a seat on a council advisory panel. Anybody can attend a CDAR stock assessment data workshop. Anybody can attend a council meeting. Anyone can submit public comments to the council, to the FWC, to any of these processes. They're all open to the public. You can listen virtually. You can listen to recordings. You can call me. You can stop by my office and chat with me. I'd be more than happy to fill you in on what's going on, what's coming up. The best way to get involved and get up to speed on what's going on and how it all works, MREP, the Marine Resource Education Program. That's how I got involved in this. That's how I got my education in all things fishery science and management. And I'm blessed to still be involved with MREP. And I am now a program principal for the Southeast region and I sit on the steering committee for the National Marine Resource Education Program because that's how much I believe in getting educated on the process. I also currently sit on three advisory panels for the Gulf of Mexico Fishery Management Council. I'm the chair of the Outreach and Education Technical Committee. I'm the chair of the Data Collection AP. I sit on the Refish AP. And that's all because I showed up and asked to be put on those advisory panels and was elected by the council because I attend council meetings and I'm involved in the process and I bothered to get educated on it. So that's all you have to do to get involved and to start making a difference. And if you can't, talk to someone like me. Fill me in on how you feel and I'd be more than happy to pass your opinions along or talk to the council members. We're all here to try to make the fishery best that it can be and to allow for optimum yield. So everybody can participate in the fishery, but we all have to participate in the fishery and the pie is only so big. Everybody wants more fish, but there's only so many in the Gulf of Mexico. So we all have to figure out how to take a bite of that small sandwich together. And it's, uh, it's tricky to say the least, especially with data changes that are coming through right now with MREP FES. So that's a whole nother video that we're going to be doing soon. Uh, the difference between the MREP Coastal Household Telephone Survey and the MREP FES or uh, Fishing Effort Survey, which was a change in recreate, private recreational data collection that is really throwing a wrench into all things fishery science and management. But again, that's a whole nother video because I don't want to sit here for two hours and I don't think you do either. Uh, now... Keep in mind, we brought up some questions at the beginning of this video that I wanted to reference. So hopefully you've watched the whole thing. Why do we need dead fish for a Goliath grouper stock assessment? Well, you need dead fish for a stock assessment because the biggest tenet of a stock assessment is what's called age and growth composition. Or how old is this fish at this size? And the only way to do that is by killing the fish and taking the otolith or the ear bone out of the head of the fish. That's why you see the FWC at our dock all the time, because they're cutting fish up and taking otoliths out, and they're taking that back to the lab to do age and growth composition studies. So age and growth is super important. The only way to do that is by killing the fish. So we're going to do that with these Goliath groupers under this new FWC proposed plan. Again, that's a state managed fishery that's a state run thing and the state of florida has an amazing lab right here in st petersburg it's called fwri or the florida wildlife research institute 
and they do tours now because of covid they haven't been doing public tours unfortunately but they will resume those soon and i cannot recommend that enough if you're interested reach out to me i can get you involved in uh, taking a tour of the florida wildlife research institute it's totally totally worth it uh what is fisheries independent monitoring also known as fim that is the most important kind of gold standard for fishery science. That's when scientists go out there on the water and prosecute the fishery in a certain way. Inshore in the state of Florida around Tampa Bay, they do seine net studies over certain geographic regions and they do what's called a stratified random sampling. So they have all these different grids and they randomly pick these stratified samples and they use those straight strata sorry to uh, combine that fisheries independent assessment or a kind of stock abundance uh, by counting everything in the same net there's also plenty of other ways that fisheries independent uh, monitoring is done through video surveys through trawl surveys through uh, a, a, a set a specific set of gear but the importance is that stratified random sampling. It's super interesting how it works. It's also super complicated. I still just barely understand it. So again, that's a whole nother video that we should be doing soon. Eric Weather, if you're watching from FWRI, I'm going to tap you for that one. Now, fisheries dependent monitoring is the other proponent or pillar of fishery science. So fishery science is made up of fisheries independent monitoring and fisheries dependent monitoring. Fisheries independent monitoring is like the gold standard, really, really good information because it's done the same year after year after year. And that data set is very reliable, unchanging and really, really steady through time. So they always look to fisheries independent monitoring to kind of ground truth what they're seeing on the other side of things, which is fisheries dependent monitoring. Now, for most species, there's only fisheries dependent monitoring because there's not enough funding to do FIM or fisheries independent monitoring for every species, which is a huge problem. So fisheries dependent monitoring is when the FWC uh, goes out on our charter boats and party boats and they put port observers out. Those are the observers on the commercial boats. Those are the people that come down to the boat ramp with the clipboards and ask you the questions. It's super important to answer truthfully and to take the time to talk to those people. It's really important to answer truthfully because if you overestimate, it can close fisheries down and ultimately implode a fishery. If you underestimate, it can close fisheries down because it shows the fishery is collapsed. So super important to answer truthfully and to take the time to talk to them because the more data they get, the less data imputation or essentially really, really super educated guesses they have to make. So talk to the people when you see them with the clipboards, when they ask if you have a ch second to chat, talk to them, answer their questions. Also, on the whole subject of assessments, we are the only council... There's eight different federal management councils across the United States. There's the New England Council, Mid-Atlantic Council, South Atlantic Council, Caribbean Council, Gulf Council, Pacific Council, North Pacific Council, and Western Pacific Council. Those are the eight councils that manage the United States federal waters. We are the only council that shares a science center with two other councils. So the South Atlantic, the Gulf, and the Caribbean, they share one science center, the Southeast Fisheries Science Center. It's in out of Miami. The Pacific Council, they have three science centers for one council. So three councils share one science center in the Southeast. Over in the Pacific, they have three science centers for one council. That's a huge problem. And when people talk about the great red snapper count, it really makes me angry because, yeah, that was great that we spent $12 million on one fishery for two years to study one fish. But they spent the entire annual survey budget of the Southeast Fishery Science Center on one fish for a two-year study. That's a problem. 
that we don't have enough funding for fishery science and fisheries enforcement because those of you who go out in the water and prosecute the fishery lawfully there's a lot of people who don't and there's no one on the water out there to enforce those on the water regulations so super big problem we have is lack of science and lack of enforcement on the water now back to an acl closure red grouper closing lane snapper closing the midwater snapper complex that stunk, don't get me wrong, that really stinks that those fisheries closed, but an ACL closure is not like a lot of people are on Facebook are talking about. An ACL closure is a good thing in a sense because we caught the fish so quickly the ACL or allowable catch limit was reached or projected to be reached. That shut the fishery down. So that means that we're out there, there's a lot of people out there catching the fish, the fishery's healthy, we caught them quicker than anticipated, and we hit that annual catch limit. So the fishery shut down. It's not because the fishery is super unhealthy or they don't know what they're doing. It's simply that a level or a quota that is designated and, and mandatory by MSA or the Magnuson-Stevens Act, which is the overall regulation that governs our federal waters and our, our federal fisheries, ACLs are mandatory under MSA, so they have to set an ACL for each species or each species complex. And when those ACLs are met, there's accountability measures. So for lane snapper, the accountability measure is when you exceed the ACL in one year, the next year they really closely monitor the ACL, and if it's exceeded or projected to be exceeded, the fishery closes. Well, if you look, there's an ACL monitoring page for CERO or the Southeast Regional Office of NOAA Fisheries, if you look at the ACL monitoring page, the Jacks Complex, Almaco Jacks, Lesser Amber Jacks, Kubera Snapper, there's a lot of species that were exceeding the ACL on this year. So next year, guess what? There's going to be more ACL closures because those ACLs are going to be reached quick. And that's not a good thing. So the council is really going to be scrambling this year to start looking at those species and hopefully voting to increase catch levels because obviously the fisheries are healthier than expected. If we're catching the quota so quickly to shut down the fishery, the ACLs need to be adjusted up. So if that's the case, hopefully NOAA fisheries can get the job done unlike they did with Lane Snapper, and get those rule changes implemented quickly so that way we don't see the closures next year. Lane Snapper luckily will be in implemented by the end of this year, so I'm told. Red Grouper have two positive changes that are coming for recreational fishermen, so we shouldn't see, hopefully, a Red Grouper closure next year, and if we do see one, it will be super late in the year. So accountability measures are why ACL triggers, or ACL closures are triggered so that is a very extremely brief overview of fishery science and management if you have questions drop them in the comments and for the love of all things holy please take a second to read and watch this video before you share it and say this guy's an idiot because most of this stuff, or actually all of this stuff, except for my comment about how the state of Florida is the best part of the Gulf, is facts. This is how it all actually works. So hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. We're going to be do, doing more of these kind of fishery science management type videos as we go along. We just launched a new uh, website that we're going to be announcing soon. That That's what it's going to be all kind of centered around is fishing tips and tricks, fishing blogs, but also fisheries management. So stay tuned for that. Don't forget, if you're too busy to go fishing, you're just too darn busy. Hopefully, we'll see you Friday morning on Fox 13 for our Good Catch segment every Friday at 8.15. Hopefully, we'll see you Saturday morning from 6 to 8 a.m. talking fishing on the Real Animals radio show. And then don't forget, every Sunday night, 8.30 p.m. on the Hubbard's Marina Facebook and YouTube channel, we've got our live stream show. Y'all have a good night. Tight lines. And we'll see you on the water.